Hey team, welcome back to another episode of the Intentional Agribusiness Leader Podcast. This is Mark Jewell, and uh, I'm on here with my friend Michael today. And uh, Michael, help me pronounce the last name. Is it Pashada? Is that how we how we say the last name? If you were in Sicily, you were saying it correct. But if you're in South Georgia, a lot of folks would say Pescada, and yeah. I'm fine with Pescada. So, got it. Pescada is what we'll go with. I live with Italians. You should know this. So this is why I'm what I'm I'm reading, what I'm learning how to speak here with my my wife and my Italian mother-in-law living in my house. So oh, that's very good, Mark. You're very perceptive. So yeah. All right. Good stuff, man. Well, hey, I want to open up with our with our, our traditional question at this point. What does it mean for you to be intentional, Michael? Man, for me, Mark, it's it's about the heart. And if I'm thinking about what I'm gonna get done for the day, uh, when I wake up in the morning. Usually I'll have things that are cloudy on my head, but whatever's in my heart, I'm going to see it through. And I feel like a lot of times, uh, even in work, you know, our heart is drawn closest to those people that we have the strongest connections with. And that's who we're going to get stuff done for. And uh, for me, you know, I, I, I've been thinking about what it means to be wholehearted a lot. And, uh, you know, because we only have one of those. And a lot of times we're drug in so many different directions. And so for me, just thinking about, you know, putting your heart into something and, and you know, as we, as I'm coaching my, my, my kids right now and trying to get them to be more involved with chores or, you know, do the little things that, you know, would help me out tremendously, you know, to get out the door or whatever that looks like, you know, I'm trying to help them understand that the heart leads. And so for me, intentional starts at the heart. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where where does that come from for you? Where's that, that belief system derived? Where do you drive that from? I mean, definitely from my upbringing. Um, you know, I saw it from my parents, you know, they had me in, in, in a church setting from an early age, Mark, mm-hmm. you know, even as my wife and I have grown older and got kids and, or had kids and been fortunate about that, you know, now we're being able to introduce those same things that I saw growing up. And for me, it's all about finding that community because that really helps you tap into a whole different type of leadership style for, for me anyway, where it becomes a, a lot more about intentionality, ne- not necessarily actions, but w- where are you coming from with something like that? And, and where are you going to be uh, kind of led from? So, and, and I know that's kind of a, Obviously, it's it's a spiritual kind of essence, but at the same time, for me, you know, it's it's easy for me to just think about, hey, where's my heart at today, and and see where it leads me. You bet. I love it, man, and I, and I love your humble nature and the uh, the root of of where that's coming from. And it's so important, it's so important to really know. It, it sounds like you kind of have one of those things that we teach, which is that clarity. And like at the end of the day, this is what I'm trying to create in this relationship. This is what I'm trying to create with these kids. Even if part of what I'm just trying to create is a little, a, a little, a few things off my list that the kids can now handle yeah. well, I'm <laughs> so sure. that I can be I'm more, sure right? Got a lot of that more. Yeah. 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 Well, we've got half a dozen that we're, uh, that we work with inside and outside the house. So I, I'm, <clears throat> I'm right in line with you right there. So uh, good. So, uh, you know, a lot of organizations across the broad scope of ag, we talk a lot about this, are struggling, you know, to retain, attract talent, et cetera. Just curious from your perspective, from your experience, how does intention play into that? How do you be intentional about that? What's been what's been working for you? Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. Um, so I, I work for a company in what some would consider as the biostimulant space of specialty fertilizers. And it's a tough space. Um, you know, people expect a lot, um, whether that's the leadership of the groups or whether that's the investors of the group, they expect a lot. And so, you know, there's been a lot of, of I guess, push and pull within the, the employees or comings and goings as people are trying new things and trying to build up different co- companies. And so I've been with the same company for six years which is a lifetime by certain standards of these types of companies. Today's day and age, that's true. <laughs> and, and I have a lot of counterparts that work for my same company that are in that six to 10 year range. And, you know, I, I think we've had some really great leaders within our company. We fostered some really good environments um, where we can, 
we can work together and we can collaborate. And I think that makes a big difference. But, you know, and I think, you know, this more than anybody, you know, uh, retention is recruitment. And for me, retaining and getting buy-in continuously over and over again from the folks that are, you know, around me that I'm going to have conversations with every day that I'm going to rely on for this or that. And now, you know, as I've done different things within the company and, and been fortunate to grow into different types of roles, you know, I, I need a different type of buy-in. And so just being able to let those folks in that have a huge part in my success and, you know, let their voices be heard is the, the most important thing I can do to make them feel engaged and, and continuously retain them and recruit them because it's them. And if I'm going to rely on them, I'm going to let them be as central to what I'm doing as I can be. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. And you, you, you said the words in there that retention is recruitment, you know, and that's a, a really bold statement. I don't, I know that everybody wants to retain their good people, right? There's, there's a, there's a healthy amount of turnover and like every organization should have when I mean, a tree's got to lose some leaves <laughs> every, oh, yeah. every fall. Right. But you know, retention is recruitment. So I, I, you also mentioned some stuff about leadership in there. So how, what is, what is intentional leadership? How does intentional leadership play into that retention? What, what, what's, what's made you want to stay or who has been a, how have leaders kind of helped you want to stick around and, and continue to be a part of, of your current organization? You know, I think there's a healthy amount of uh, folks being able to delegate. Um, and, and it started small. Obviously, I, I started on the ground level from, you know, just being in the field and, and working with growers and working with dealers and distributors like anybody else. And, you know, um, I had the opportunity to, to to run a couple of, you know, more grower focused trials and obviously produce a result, you know, not necessarily whether the products work or not, but how those were packaged and communicated. And, you know, I was thankful that I got delegated that responsibility of saying, hey, get this out to the team. And from that one opportunity, you know, it's definitely grown my chances to do that over and over again. And as, you know, we've armed, you know, our sales force with things that have helped them grow and communicate it's been uh, it's been a real blessing to me to see them kind of have that same kind of delegation that I've been able to put toward them. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I believe that, you know, power is being able to let power go. And for, for me, it's been a huge uh, it's been a huge way of, of keeping folks around me and keeping them growing. And if they're growing, then that's going to help me out in the long run. So being able to not be afraid to let things go being able to, to, to pull back, even when it's something I'm super passionate about that I want to put my hands on. I gotta, I gotta let those folks get in there and jump some hurdles and, and, and really get after it. Cause that's going to help them build what they can be. Yeah. Okay. So if, if I'm a leader and I have some things that I know would, boy, it would be easier if somebody else is taking care of some of this stuff for me. But I also know if I do it, it gets done right. And we're not going to have rework. We're not going to have to do it over. We're not going to have to retrain someone. I find myself stuck, right? Because the, and, and there's a very powerful statement that you said here, which is power is being able to let power go. <clears throat> That's a powerful statement, right? <laughs> so what, <clears throat> what advice would you give somebody who's maybe holding onto the power and letting it go would benefit them? benefit the organization, benefit the team member that would get to get to, to learn something new. But it's tough, right? Because we're always in the heat of the battle. There's always deadlines to meet, customers to keep happy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? <clears throat> What's your advice? Man, you know, I, I've been faced with this a lot recently. And um, there's been there's been some influences toward me that have, have shown me a couple of things that I, I can't take credit for. Obviously, you, people are aware of Dr. Brene Brown. People mm -hmm. are aware of what she does. But there's two pieces of this that have really spoken to me as I've delegated things. And number one, it's uh, that, that clarity is kindness. And as we're talking to other folks and as I'm working with people in my organization, the more clear that I can delegate them tasks or tell them what to do, 
that that's nice. That's a nice thing because you don't have to force people to do things with an iron fist. What we can do as leaders is, is be clear about, hey, listen, let me show you what this has looked like in the past. Do you feel comfortable with this? Hey, let me, you know, work this up, work this email up. Let me see it. Let's try to spitball things back and forth and build, you know, some teaching moments in there. Mm -hmm. And that's kindness because then they don't feel like it's you saying, go do this responsibility right now. You know, it, it's not, it, it's bringing the ownership to them, letting them take part of that. The other part that uh, Dr. Brown has, has mentioned that I've integrated is this statement that we're not always going to get along and it's let's rumble. And so, mm. you know, Mark, if I'm looking at you and you're, you're saying, you know, Michael, that podcast, that wasn't really good. I'm really going to need you to take that from the top. You might say, Michael, we're about to rumble about this. That mm. lets me know in my head <clears throat> that it's not an aggressive thing. More or less, it's we didn't see eye to eye on this or we didn't get along. And I do that a lot with my teammates because we might come from different parts of the world. And, and I might say, hey, this might sound like we're about to rumble, but, but hear me out on this. And that lets people be more vulnerable to open up and actually have a conversation instead of get, getting in a conflict, basically. Mm -hmm. All right. Michael showed up to teach today, you guys. So pay attention to what he's saying here. So we're bringing in some Brene Brown, little Dr. Brene Brown. She, For those of you that don't know, uh, here is a, an author, um, a researcher, someone, uh, she's down in Texas, I believe. I forget which university, but she has done a lot of research around how to help people work together. Understanding shame really is the, the, the big thing that she focuses on. That's kind of her thing. And let's be honest, we see a lot of that a lot of people either hiding from shame or running from shame. And that's where a lot of our letdowns happen in the workplace is because people are struggling to, uh, to own, to fully own maybe a mistake, right? Or um, maybe they're, they're, they're afraid to let someone down. So they're still, they're trying to avoid the shame of letting someone down. So they don't take the risk. They don't try, they don't push themselves. They don't make that extra call. They don't make that empowered decision. And, and instead they wait on you, the leader to, to give them, um, to, to, you know, to give them permission or, or, or whatever the case may be. So a couple of things you said about, uh, Dr. Brown in here. So clarity is kindness, right? And, and the, so here's, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. This is my take on clarity. So I agree, right? Clarity is kindness, 100%. Clarity, we, in fact, in our work, we have a module called intentional clarity because it's so important. In fact, it's the first one, <laughs> okay? Knowing, knowing what you want, knowing why you want it, right? And then courageously and aggressively pursuing what it is that you want. That's my definition of what intention really is, especially intentional clarity. And so but here's, here's the how-to below that. And this is the scary part and what most people don't get because they don't block time to do this is that it takes time to develop a clear path forward for that young upcoming employee so that you can be clear right? It yeah. takes time to clearly document a process or what your expectations are so that you can actually delegate that task effectively. Often it's, you're just pitching stuff off the top of your to-do list in the heat of the moment saying, Hey, <laughs> take this. I don't have time to do it. So interested in your, in your take on, on my take around what that, what it takes oh, to man. actually be clear. Oh man, Mark, you, you nailed it, buddy. I, I, I just want to say this. If I looked at the folks that people are always coming to me and saying, man, did you hear what so-and-so did? Hey, listen, I mean, can, can, can I not be in the loop on that? My response is always, I almost want to stick up for that person because I know that they're fast paced. I know that this is something new to them for them essentially, but you're a hundred percent right that communication and systems building within an organization or how we network with each other and make people feel a part of stuff, it takes time. And it is highly inconvenient most times. But in the long run of serving the goal or whatever you want to courageously try to achieve, like if you have a BHAG, which is the Jim Collins, big, hard day, you know, hairy, audacious goal kind of mentality of what you want to do as a company or even what you want to do as a person, you know, 
that that requires a lot to go out and get something that is the biggest win or the biggest you know success whether that's a sales or personal thing and so you're 100 percent right mark you know these things a lot of folks are not willing to, to 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 take that time to to maybe you know have a more humble approach as far as being inclusive of other people's ideas or even you know, backing off of their own original intent, which is my struggle. You know, I might have like the greatest idea in the world, but then, you know, somebody will have a better idea and I, I'm still kind of clenching on to, I'm like, man, but really I just, mm. but in reality, if I can depart myself from my own feelings, a lot of times I will wind up somewhere way better than where I started. And so you're a hundred percent right on that mark. And I agree. Yeah. And, and, you know, you mentioned it being uncomfortable, right? It's not always comfortable to take the time to be intentional, to create that intentional clarity for someone. And it comes back to the very first thing that you said on the first question, when I said, what does it mean for you to be intentional? You said, it starts with the heart, right? Do you have the heart? Are you putting your heart into the people that you lead, that you manage, that you are responsible for, you know? So it all ties together, my friend. I love it. Okay, let's keep moving. So, what, what has um, what's been a big hurdle that you personally have had to overcome, Michael, over the course of your career? What's one of the, been one of those big hurdles that you've had to had to jump over, climb over, crawl under in your time? Mm. You know, when I first thought about this question, it's I feel like I've had a long time to process hurdles. Mm -hmm. But in reality, it seems I'm like, well, those hurdles weren't as big as I thought they were. And, you know, because I, I first of all, I'll, I'll back up. You know, when I was at I'm wearing UGA stuff. OK, I am. I have yep. a couple of degrees from the University of Georgia, but I was a terrible student, Mark. Uh -huh. And I thought that was a huge hurdle. I, I was a terrible student. I wasn't going to be able to get into a master's program. I wasn't going to be able to do this. But then I worked for UGA. Eventually, I got into a master's program. All right, it's not a big deal. I learned how to become a student. You know, I came from a place where, you know, not, not a whole lot of, you know, folks that were Ivy League out of Tiff County, Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, some, but not a lot. And so, you know, I felt like that was a big hurdle. But it really, looking back, it wasn't that big of a deal. And then, you know, even kind of not being a great student, you know, I came out. I did some things and I was like, well, maybe I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't have a good enough start as far as like, what's my first job out of college or what's my, you know, I thought that was going to be a negative, but really looking back on it, you know, even though I've had a couple of, you know, pretty good opportunities since, you know, I graduated, you know, it feels like all of them have been small hurdles in the same direction. And mm -hmm. so now it's like, well, those those hurdles didn't seem as significant but now my biggest hurdle really is you know where do we go from here and, and it's it's a future hurdle that I look at every day and it's like okay I'm not I'm trying to grow consistently but where does that lead me to and you know for for me it, it starts on a, a daily basis of what my hurdles might be today and and how do I achieve those and you know, I know another question is like your your biggest win, but I have so many wins and losses. I have so many little hurdles and big hurdles and things that kind of fall in the middle. So it's like it, it kind of bleeds together. Yeah. But to answer your biggest hurdle question, I, I definitely think the the biggest hurdle that I've cleared is uh, just being more relationship focused. You know, mm -hmm. you want to achieve so much. We all have this mentality of, you know, grabbing the world by the tail and twisting it down and putting it in our pocket. Mm -hmm. But the, the reality is that world is full of people and it's full of a lot of people. So how we interact with those people, it really dictates a lot of where we end up going. And if we're fortunate enough to meet people along the way that can influence us, we need to be able to take notes. We need to inter integrate a little bit more of those types of people in what we do every day. So yeah, man. You know, I I I, I wish more people had that mindset <clears throat> around being being relational. I, th I think we live in a world today where we could all benefit from just slowing down a little bit 
and paying attention to the the neighbor across the street and seeing what's going on. What's going on with David over there across the street today? You know, um, mm-hmm. asking some questions, being genuinely interested, not being in such a hurry. The other night we went out to our oldest uh, child um, wanted us to meet the um, uh, her her partner's uh, parents. Okay. Mm-hmm. So they're deep in the relationship and they, she wanted us to, to go and meet her significant other's parents. Right. So we go to dinner and uh, I forgot my phone, which is not necessary. It was a Sunday night. It's not necessary. There's nothing going on, but you're just so accustomed to having the phone. Right. Yeah. And yeah. who knows, maybe, and there's usually a notification or 20 that goes off on a Sunday night, depending on how you have your notification settings set. Right. Yeah. Anyway, I just, I forgot it at home. I had to navigate by memory and, and find the restaurant. There was no way to use the GPS to get there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anyway, I just, I noticed, I, you know, three hours went by and I never reached for it. I never looked at it. I never went to the bathroom and like checked my LinkedIn or anything like that or email, you know, and it was so nice because I could just be there and lead that conversation and ask questions and be interested. Yeah. You know, it's all, and it's all relational. And this is, we're not doing business. I'm not selling anything to these people. And the kids are going to do what the kids are going to do. They're 22 years old. They're on their own path at this point. But by golly, it was so interesting and refreshing to just be there for those couple hours. And then the, you know, the half hour drive to town, the half hour drive back with my wife and just not be looking down, checking notifications, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so... Mm-hmm. By the way, I was in, I'm in your camp, man. I was like a two point, I had, I had to scrap my way to get to a 2.8 GPA coming out of the university of Minnesota. So I was, <laughs> when, whenever the, the internships would come along saying you had to have like a 3.25 to apply. I'm like, I just didn't even try, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> did you, I don't yeah. know. Did you have a similar experience uh, to me? I don't know if this is not to put you on the spot with this, but I found graduate school much easier. To, ah. to stay on top of like, as far as like writing the papers and doing good quality work and turning stuff in on time, the things that there's being a good learner. And then there's just being the person who executes on turning stuff in on time and, you know, mm-hmm. being prepared. So I don't know. That was my experience that grad school was way easier for me, man. And, and I was so, so blessed Mark, because I, I did have the opportunity to work on campus. You know, if you work sure. for the university for six months, they'll pay for nine hours of your grad school a semester. So Mm-hmm. You know, great university system of Georgia Perk. And so I actually had a real office and I was not making r- real money, but I had a real office. And right. and also I was in charge of, you know, mentoring these super awesome, well-educated students that were coming from awesome college preparatory backgrounds. And I would see how serious they were. I mean, these guys were like 19 and 20 they were, they were the furthest from being an amazing student you would imagine, but they knew what to do. And they highly influenced me, Mark, because I'm like, if these guys can go have fun and still knock out 4.0s from the Terry college of business at UGA, what's my excuse, man, I have an office, like I have internet printing capabilities. I have all this and like, I better get right because you know, my students, they might judge if they knew I was slacking at grad school, they'd be, they'd be probably judging me. So I right. wanted to step up for them, but I was older too. Uh, my wife and I were pretty serious. So we were about to get married. And so I knew I needed to to go out and, and nail it. And uh, ultimately I ended up having a job during my final semester that I started in the middle of kind of my studies, but everything was paid for. So I got to bounce from UGA and my office job to a different kind of job, but sure. being older helped. Definitely. There's helped. something to be said about maturity. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. For me. Right. Yeah. Who's been uh, in, 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 in the creation of your maturity, who's been somebody who you've really admired over the course of your career? I mean, for my career um, in, in the state of Georgia, there's a, there's a, a, a gentleman that's an institution, uh, His name is Abbott Massey, A-B-I-T. He's around 95-ish. I might be butchering that. He's around 95 years old, but he will still be at the the state capitol. He ran the Georgia Poultry Federation for about 50 years. Mm. Um, And he is the kindest person I've ever met. 
And mm -hmm. Abbott is, he knows no strangers. He's friendly. And uh, one time, you know, I was seeing him interact with these young pages and interns at the state Capitol. Um, obviously, he's a veteran of the halls of the Capitol building in Georgia. Everybody knows Abbott Massey. But he treated me like, I mean, I was his personal helper. I mean, he, you know, engaged me, asked me about my family. You know, uh, he asked me about my wife. Obviously, what does she do? Told me about his wife, you know, and his family. But he stopped me and, and he said, Michael, you know, I always get to know people. A lot of people want to know why. But he said, I read this book when I was probably 25 years old. And you need to read it. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? He's like, I don't want you to be offended. But the book is by Dale Carnegie. And it's called How to Win Friends and Influence People. Mm -hmm. And I, he, I don't know if he gave, I think he gave me a copy. And I was like, do I need that? What am I, what it was, <laughs> what's he, have I made him mad? But I read it and, and it was almost yeah. to the line of things that I had seen him do over the Kate, the, you know, 40 days of, you know, being right next to him at the state Capitol. And I still recommend that to the, the best people that I work with, because mm. even though those words were written, I mean, almost a hundred years ago is what it seems like mm -hmm. the principles of, you know, re relationality and being invested in others. I mean, they're timeless. And I just feel like he embodied that. He still embodies that. He's, you know, friends with some of my family members now. We have like a different relationship. But I mean, he highly influenced my, you know, and, and another one is obviously my father. Mm -hmm. My father treated everyone that was associated or on the periphery of his personal business. He was an entrepreneur. You know, he treated everybody like they were the most important person. And I think there's a huge aspect that's missing of kind of our fast paced world, our drive through culture, where it's like, uh, everything's an inconvenience, but people are people and they want to be treated like such. Yeah. I mean, I cannot agree more. And that's a fantastic story about both of these guys and what, and, and, and a great book rack for anybody who's looking for some time tested and proven content. It's not, it's not a long book. It is not no. a long book. No. And I had a similar experience. Uh, it's kind of, kind of funny. I just found a copy of it on the bookshelf in my mom and dad's house, you know, growing up and my dad never said anything about it at all, but I opened it, I opened it up and here was his notes inside the book. And I need, I think I still have it around here somewhere. I think I kept it or somebody in my family did, but it was my dad's handwritten notes inside the book from when he went through the Dale Carnegie course, he had started an aerial photography business. He was a pilot and oh. he got a bunch of guys out selling these pictures of farms and everything back in the, in the early seventies. So he went through the course uh, to kind of help him obviously, you know, boost up his business and everything. And so we, we had that. And so I, that was my, and other, you know, being in the leadership world, obviously people recommend that to you. There's a whole company, you can hire them uh, and, you know, to, to, to train people and so forth. And so, but it's a great book and that's a very cool Abbott Massey bringing, uh, bringing you the humbling advice. Like, Hey, I think you should read this. <laughs> oh yeah. No, and yeah. It, was, it was definitely, he's got a great article about him. A B I T Massey. Okay. With a Y, if you want to look it up, it's got his whole, the, 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 the university just did a great piece on him and mm -hmm. uh, highly, obviously a, a highly valued person. We're very blessed to have him in Georgia agriculture. So of course, and poultry being a big, big business down that way for sure. Okay. So good. Well, uh, so, you know, I mean, you've got, uh, how many kids do you guys have? We have three. Got three kids, a got lot. a busy, uh, got a busy work schedule, right? And both you guys have stuff going on. And so what do you, what do you do to keep your energy up, man? Cause you know, that takes, that takes a lot. Man, the energy is, I've never, I've never really had a huge problem with it more. Mm -hmm. My, I tell you what I have a huge problem with creativity mm, because I just, I will get so sapped in this cycle of call. I'm sure you do too of calls and emails and correspondence and follow-ups and all this. And, you know, obviously those are great things. You don't want to miss those. You don't want to miss those moments where you might be able to pull something, but to just take in something that, you know, open my lens up is what I like to say. If I open my lens up and let everything in, 
you know, I want to feel more inspired than when I started. And, you know, there's just experience is a huge part. Being outside is a huge part. Um, you know, anytime that I can go do something with my kids that's out of the normal that they don't like push back on is a big thing. Um, so I'm just always looking for opportunities to, to let different experiences in so I can pull some sort of inspiration on creativity from and I guess in a way that definitely gets at this energy piece, because when you attack something with a certain appetite for creation, it changes the quality of the work and perfect, you know, pleasure in the job puts perfection in the work in my books. That's another thing I always tell the folks I work alongside. So definitely want to bring, bring that creativity and that spice. Man, you're full of the quotes today. I'm writing these down as we go. <laughs> pleasure in the job. What is it? Pleasure in the job brings perfection in the work. Oh, yeah. Come yeah. on, man. Oh, yeah. I love it. <laughs> um, they're not original. None of these are original, Mark. I can't yeah, take that's... credit for any of them. Yeah. Uh, been really fortunate to have a lot of good, good people, good people yeah. to pour in to me and, and be around me. So. I can tell. I can tell. Cool. So you bring, it brings up an interesting point, right? Because if, 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 uh, so we have a, a tool that we use with clients on in certain deployments where uh, called Strength Scope, not to be confused with Strengths Finder, which most people are uh, familiar with because of the Gallup organization. But Strength Scope is a a UK based assessment tool uh, that we uh, that we sell. And one of the um, the big takeaways that you get from this is what are the things that energize you when you're in, when you're in your work? What energizes you based on the way your brain is naturally wired? This is just who you are. Michael's different than Mark and Mark is different than Christine and so on and so forth. And we all have our unique energizers. What's cool about being in our energizers is the more that we do them, the more we feel uh, energized by doing them, mm -hmm. right? So if I'm, for me, it's developing others. When I'm in developing others mode, I can make podcasts all day long. I can teach all day long. I can speak all day long. But man, if you ask me to go and do a lot of detail work, I can actually take the podcast that we're recording right now and splice that together with the intro, the outro, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. maybe a commercial in the middle, make sure it all looks good, sounds good, et cetera. Man, I got to outsource that because that stuff drains me. So we have energizers and we have drainers and we like to help our clients pay attention to that. So it sounds like you've kind of naturally caught that, which I think is cool, right? Like, hey, creativity is a little bit of a drainer sometimes and I got to find ways around that. And, and I think intentional leaders, our, I don't, I don't think I know, intentional leaders are always conscious about creating their time to be focused more on energizers, less on drainers, build their team around them to focus on the things that they don't naturally do well, delegate, outsource, et cetera. So really, really good catch. So, all right. Uh, last couple of questions as we kind of bring this in for a landing, I think we may be over our time already, but I've really enjoyed it today. So we're going to keep, uh, keep it going for a minute. Uh, what's something that you get to improve on this year? Hmm. I mean, there's lots, uh, you know, time and communication, they're constant things. Um, you know, things have been pretty fast paced uh, for a while. Uh, you know, we've been really fortunate coming out of COVID that, you know, just the professional things and obviously my personal life got lots happening. But really, you know, to, to, to use the intentional word, being intentional about, del you know, blocking off time where, you know, especially my family time where it's just me, my wife, my kids, kind of how that looks, because, you know, in the past, it's been like, we're riding this roller coaster. You know, my wife has a, you know, really great career, you know, it's highly involved. It's a high, it's a big commitment, big sacrifice, but when, when can we block this off and take some time for ourselves and, you know, energize ourselves and, and what does that even look like? And so, you know, it's funny because obviously my wife and I have been together a long time, but there's never a wrong time to 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 try some of these new things that we've always had on our bucket list of going to do or experiences. And, you know, I, I hope we get some of those things done in 2024. Um, anything will be an improvement, frankly, Mark. I, I have to be vulnerable about that. You know, it's like, hey, man, we put it on the calendar. We can stick to it. Let's let's start working through it. So Let's mm -hmm. work through the details. And I mean, the kids bring them. We'll see what happens. Let's go for it. Yeah, I love it. 
that's something, man, most of my clients are working through that one right now. How do we, yeah. how do we get time management? It's a top, one of the top three things that we get asked to help them improve. And, and it's not time management training. Nobody needs to be taught how to use the calendar on their phone. You can ask Siri to put that on there for right. you. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. It's really become, it's about the standard for how I get to experience my day. Yeah. Right. That's intentional leaders to me have a better or, or just a different take on how I get to experience my day. That's right. You know, and for, for us in our house, if it's, if it's chaos, it has to go. And I've got some things. I'll be honest. I'm not perfect with this. I got some chaos on my calendar right now. And I was telling my team earlier today, it's like, listen, this, this chaos gets to go away because it's not that it's bad work. It's just distracting from the mission. And oh, it's yeah. not important, right? And, and part of the mission is to be a present dad, to be a present husband, to be healthy and lead a team and build a business and, 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 right? So anytime that chaos gets a little bit too chaotic, we have to, we got to check that at the door. No doubt. Absolutely. But a lot of people have standards of chaos. That's, that's you know, I, I can resemble that remark, Mark. Mm -hmm. I can definitely resemble that. So, you know, and I think there's a lot of folks that are probably my age that feel like they've strived really hard. And I, I feel this way all the time. You know, they've strived, they've worked, they've, they've done extra, extra. They've been extra, extra for a long time for maybe their companies. But that extra, extra every day of what they wake up and what they fall asleep with isn't there. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm trying to, to shift that. Yeah. And you know, it, I don't think this cold turkey thing of like, I'm going to shift the extra extra from one bucket to the next. I think, you know, I use when I'm, I'm talking to, I got a chance to talk to some, some other college students in Tennessee, not too long ago. And I was talking about buckets and, and putting big rocks in a bucket. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how do you get the, the most important rocks? Well, the most important rocks are the biggest. And if you don't, if you want to put the lid on a bucket, you put the big rocks in first and then the smaller rocks can go in next. And then the sand, well, guess what? The sand just falls around the big rocks. Mm -hmm. And so you got to make sure that if you're going to carry your bucket from day to day, that you want to put the lid on it and you know, you got to put the big rocks in first. Yeah. And so that's kind of where I am to shift that bucket and, and shift my own priorities. So, you know, and sometimes that looks messy when you take the rocks out of the bucket but yeah, really. you got to. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and we all have plenty of sand blowing around in our eyes, getting us distracted if we're for yeah. vulnerable and honest. So that leads me to my last question, which is how, how important is vulnerability to you and being able to create an intentional workplace? I have, I have personally seen it shift attitudes of organizations in a big way. And, mm -hmm. wow. you know, when, when you can, be the person that looks in the mirror first, then I think it becomes more okay for people around you that are on your, in your company or, you know, in your personal life to look at themselves the same way. And so, you know, it's been, sometimes people can abuse that vulnerability, but I think the vast majority of people that see the vulnerability that you're willing to display will say, you know what, Hey, we appreciated that. You know, we, we even notice that in ourselves or, you know, maybe they say something in this meeting where it, it everybody kind of puts their mirror up and looks themselves in the face and say, well, how do we work together better? Or, you know, you're right, that happened. And how do we move forward? Or what are the next steps after we've admitted this? You know, and those things do really can be hard. You know, they can be pretty hard. Um, and as a leader though, and being intentional, you have to be willing to put the mirror up first. And yeah. so I, I think that, um, I think the vulnerability is important. It's underutilized. Um, if you utilize it correctly, it can absolutely make all the difference in getting to the point that you want to go as a leader. So, yeah, there's a, there's a bit of surrender that has to happen, right? To be oh, yeah. vulnerable enough, open enough to say, hey, I've got a problem here. I don't know how to solve for this here. I need some help mm -hmm. over here. So great answer, man. And this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much, man, for making the time. 
for being on here on the Intentional Agribusiness Leader podcast. Any last thoughts, recommendations, things that uh, that that we should know before we officially land the plane today? Man, one book. Yeah. Buy in. Uh, how to keep your good ideas or great ideas from getting shot down. Okay. By John Cotter, K O T T E R. Man, it's another short book. Um, it has been a really important part of my last 10 years uh, as far as how I've worked with teams and how I've been, you know, you know, really fortunate to be charged to lead teams. But that's been a, a really big, uh, really big help to me as I look for ways to, uh, you know, we all deal with negativity. If we're on a team, somebody's going to be negative. That's just what they do. You know, it's like God just gives you a way. Hey, you're going to have this one person you're going to have to deal with and you're going to have to figure that out. But if we let those negativity people in to what we're doing and make them a central part, we're no doubt going to come through stronger than where we were if everybody just said yes in the beginning. So definitely wanted to make that recommendation, Mark. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. We greatly appreciate it. We'll make sure we get that in the show notes for you guys. And uh, thank you. Thanks for being on with me today. It's a pleasure, Mark. Thank you so much, buddy.